You are listening to a program from BBC Radio 4. Let's start with an ending, with the tomb of Napoleon Bonaparte. It's housed here in the Royal Chapel of Les Invalides, for many years a military hospital. The dome of the chapel, 300 feet high, is an unmissable gilded monument on the Parisian skyline. I believe this is the ideal final resting place for the greatest ruler of France. After his death on the island of St Helena in the mid-Atlantic at the age of 51, Napoleon's body was 19 years later brought here to Paris and given a magnificent funeral. It was the 2nd of December, the anniversary both of his coronation and of his greatest victory, the Battle of Austerlitz. Despite the bitterly cold December weather, over a million French people turned out to line the route of the funeral cortege, which passed under the Arc de Triomphe and along the Champs-Élysées, until it finally stopped here at Les Invalides. At the entrance to the crypt of the tomb are two gigantic bronze doors and above is a quotation from Napoleon's will which reads I wish my ashes to rest on the banks of the Seine among the people of France whom I love so much. And here in the centre of the room is the gigantic sarcophagus. Inside it is a nest of no fewer than six coffins made from iron, mahogany, two layers of lead, ebony and oak. But does this grand tomb really give us the right clues for understanding Napoleon's character and his achievements? Since his death, has any historical figure been more misunderstood? Certainly, after Adolf Hitler visited this tomb after the fall of Paris in June 1940 and described the experience as the greatest and finest moment of my life, the two leaders have been tarred with the same brush of tyranny and megalomania. In Napoleon's case, much of that's a myth. And this, the week of the bicentenary of the Battle of Waterloo, seems a great time to try to set the record straight. What do we think we know about Napoleon? Though he's been the subject of more than 3,000 biographies, in Britain he's often portrayed as the tiny tyrant, the coarse Corsican who became the bogeyman of Europe. Napoleon was unlucky in that his rise coincided with that of the first fully professional British political caricaturists, James Gilray, Thomas Rowlandson and George Cruikshank. I have here a copy of Gilray's cartoon from 1805, possibly the most famous political cartoon of all time, The Plum Pudding in Danger. In it, the British Prime Minister, William Pitt the Younger, wearing a regimental uniform and hat, is sitting at a table with Napoleon. They're each carving into a large plum pudding, a globe showing all the nations of the world. Pitt's slice is considerably larger than Napoleon's, but he also appears much, much taller, but that's simply not true. Napoleon was actually five foot six, the average height of Frenchmen at the time, and considerably taller than contemporaries such as Admiral Lord Nelson. Napoleon's racially Italian and nationally Corsican backgrounds led to endless abusive generalisations from his enemies. In 1800, the British journalist William Cobbett described him as a low-bred upstart from the contemptible island of Corsica while the French First Lady of Letters, Madame de Stael, called him a... Condottieri without manners, without fatherland, without morality. An oriental despot, a new Attila, a warrior who knew only how to corrupt and annihilate. But it's a myth that he was low-bred. Napoleon was born in Ajaccio, into very minor nobility. Never given to self-doubt, he was comfortable about his class background. There are genealogists who would date my family from the flood, and there are people who pretend that I am of plebeian birth. The truth lies between these two. The Bonapartes are a good Corsican family, little known, for we have hardly ever left the island, but much better than many of the coxcombs who take it upon themselves to vilify us. I am of the race that founds empires. 
In January 1768, Genoa sold the sovereignty of Corsica to Louis XV of France, and his family were confirmed as members of the French noblesse in 1771. Napoleon and his siblings were now entitled to royal bursaries, and Napoleon was sent away to school in France, at Autun and then Brienne. Here, next to Les Invalides on the left bank of the Seine, is the École Royale Militaire, which Napoleon entered in 1784. He was the first Corsican to go there. By the end of his schooling, he was thoroughly imbued with what his private secretary later described as... Pride and a sentiment of dignity, a warlike instinct, a genius for form, a love of order and of discipline. After spending less than four years as an active soldier, Napoleon became a general at the age of only 24. Hugely ambitious, a military genius by common consent. But he also demonstrated a ruthlessness in his early career which led to a myth or black legend surrounding his character. In October 1795, Napoleon was ordered to use all means necessary to crush a growing revolt on the streets of Paris. Between 6am and 9am on the 5th of October, Napoleon placed two cannons here, at the entrance of what used to be the Rue Saint-Nicaise. Another was facing the church of Saint-Roche at the bottom of the Rue de Dauphin, with four more strategically positioned around the city. It was Napoleon's personal decision to use grape shot, which consisted of hundreds of musket balls packed into a muslin bag that ripped open as soon as it left the cannon's muzzle. The use of it on civilians was hitherto unknown in Paris. By 4pm, the rebel columns started issuing down from side streets like the one here to the north of the Tuileries. Napoleon didn't open fire immediately, but as soon as the first enemy musket shot was heard, he unleashed a devastating artillery response. That day, somewhere between two and three hundred civilian rebels were killed, against fewer than half a dozen of Napoleon's men. It was a pivotal moment in his career. In recompense for his service in saving the revolution and possibly preventing civil war, Napoleon received a promotion. But the decision to use grape shot on the Parisian insurgents was condemned by others. Indeed, in 1811, the disgraced General Sarrazin wrote, Far from putting a stop to the blind fury of his soldiers, Bonaparte set an example of inhumanity. He cut down with his sabre wretched beings who, in their fright, had thrown down their arms and implored his mercy. Sarrazin was writing in exile in London, and it's important to put this event into context and look at the political situation in France at the time. Napoleon had witnessed the power of the mob in the revolution. His experiences in the army had shown him the horror and the political dangers arising from food riots, which he said he feared much more than battles. He was also in Paris at the time of the September massacres, when over 1,200 prisoners, including 115 priests, were murdered without trial. Good and upstanding people must be persuaded by gentle means. The rabble must be moved by terror. Since 2004, the Fondation Napoleon here in Paris has been editing and publishing Napoleon's 33,000 surviving letters. These go a long way towards clearing up some further misconceptions. For example, Napoleon had a fine sense of humour. When an archbishop wrote to him an absurdly fulsome letter congratulating him on his coming coronation, saying he would like to lay down his life for the emperor, Napoleon ordered him to be paid 12,000 francs out of the theatrical fund. Whilst he could lose his temper volcanically at times, his letters are also suffused with his charm. Apologising to his naval minister, de Cray, he writes, I'm sorry you are angry with me. Finally, when the anger has passed, nothing remains, so I hope you will not harbour any grudge against me. As emperor, Napoleon was kind and conscientious to his staff, who almost universally admired him. Far more of his personal servants volunteered to go into exile with him on St Helena than the British could allow, a remarkable tribute to him as an employer. His private secretary, Claude-François Meneval, 
recalled in his memoirs, I had expected to find him brusque and of uncertain temper, instead of which I found him patient, indulgent, easy to please, by no means exacting, merry, with a merriness which was often noisy and mocking, and sometimes of a charming bonhomie. Many critics have accused Napoleon of being a compulsive liar and bombast, but this again has to be taken in context. By 1797, after successful campaigns in Italy, the 28-year-old Napoleon was the most famous general in France, and a personality cult began to grow around him. In Paris, the Moniteur reported the celebration of Napoleon's victories with dances, cantatas, public banquets and processions, which were organised by his growing group of supporters. Napoleon certainly knew the power of propaganda. In war, intellect and judgement are the better part of reality. The art of the great captains has always been to make their own forces appear to be very large to the enemy and to make the enemy view themselves as being very inferior. Constantly in my Italian campaigns, where I had a handful of everything, I exaggerated my strength. That served my plans and did not diminish my glory. With trifling considerations, small vanities and petty passions, it is never possible to achieve anything great. It's absurd to ascribe conventional morality here. Disinformation has been an acknowledged weapon of war since war began. Was Winston Churchill a liar for letting it be thought that 185 German bombers had been shot down on one day during the London Blitz, when the true figure was far lower? Where Napoleon did err, however, was in making the exaggeration so very regular that the phrase to lie like a bulletin entered the French language, and so the lying became counterproductive, and even genuine victories came to be disbelieved, or at least heavily discounted. Napoleon certainly wanted to influence public opinion and to that end began a new career as a press proprietor and journalist, dictating such sentences as Bonaparte flies like lightning and strikes like a thunderbolt. But there was much more to him than simply a successful military tactician and propagandist. I'm here outside the Institut de France in Paris, the pantheon of French intellectual life, where Napoleon was elected a member in December 1797. He was indeed an intellectual. He went to public lectures and visited the observatory, the theatre and the opera. He championed science and socialised with astronomers. He went nowhere without his large, well-thumbed travelling library. Most of the leading European intellectuals of the day admired him, including Goethe, Byron and Beethoven, who, at first, dedicated his third symphony to Napoleon. By looking at Napoleon's early life in detail, a different picture has emerged from the one in Gilray's caricature of greedy little Boney or in Madame de Stael's description of an oriental despot. Napoleon's rise to power came at a time when France was in chaos. The ruling executive body, the Directory, was corrupt and incompetent, and inflation was again out of control. Shoes cost 40 times more in 1797 than they had in 1790. As Napoleon put it, the pear was ripe for a coup. The French wanted a stable, conservative republic, and as we shall find out tomorrow, that is exactly what he would give them. You can download many more BBC Radio 4 programmes for free. Find these at bbc.co.uk slash radio 4.